Uh, we've clearly known each other for a very long time. And we're yeah, like 15, day -day 15 years we've known each other. 15, 14? Knowledge Austin is 12. 14 years, yeah. Mm -hmm. Crazy. We've worked on a few uh, projects together. Mm -hmm. Don't you wish we had um, workshops like this to take when we started? I mean, we did take beginner workshops, but they weren't like taught by Inuit. Um, would have been such a different way to start our careers. But anyway, my name is Alithia al Baril. I'm a filmmaker from Iqaluit. I worked largely in documentary. Um, there's a fire alarm that, but the battery is low and it keeps beeping. So excuse the noise if you hear it. Um, I worked largely in documentary, but I have directed a short drama and have taken part in producing, but not directing uh, a couple of feature films along with Stacy and other people. Um, and you are? My name is Stacy Agluk. I am originally from Kogluktuk, Nunavut, but I moved here to Iqaluit, um, as Alethea said, maybe 14 years ago. And I met Alethea immediately, pretty much upon landing, and we started collaborating and working with each other um, really early on in our careers. Um, and then we like, and then we kind of did a little bit of a segue from each other um, for a few years. Alethea was really like in the doc world, um, producing and directing her her two documentaries, which she's going to talk about a little bit later. And then I kind of moved more into fiction and uh, scripted comedies and television. And we're at a point now where we've kind of realigned and re like, re like merged together. And we've taken like all of those skills that we've kind of collected from, you know, Alethea's documentary world to my fiction television world. And now we're like a power couple. <laughs> <laughs> Our uh, sort of talk or seminar or whatever today is about project development and um, I think it's kind of, it's so hard to decide what to do, um, what to create, you know, whether you're drawing or painting or making a film or making a carving or a video game or whatever like the decision of what you're going to create is such a hard thing it's a it's a personal thing um but it's also influenced in the film world by um you know business decisions and also what broadcasters and funders and distributors are looking for so it's a really um because filmmaking it's not like doing a drawing where you can draw wherever you want when you're at home but when you need to make a film, you have to raise money, which means you have to convince other people to give it to you, uh, which means you have to like do a bit of a give and take between what you want to do and what uh, people are interested in hearing from you. So it's a, um, it's a tough give or take. Um, it's a really different process. Everybody comes up with their ideas in different ways and pitches them in different ways. So we can just talk about our personal process and experience, um, which I'm sure are wildly different from each other, but also we've been on the same projects together on, in some cases. So, um, yeah. How'd you start? Well, when I moved to Ekaluit, I came here with a little bit of the intention of, you know, I just came off of being a production assistant and post-production assistant on the documentary, educational documentary, Staking the Claim. And that was my first ever kind of experience in production. And, you know, I wasn't even interested in filmmaking at that point. I just was interested in the story that we were trying to tell together. 
but through that process, I fell in love with it so much that when I did move here to Iqaluit, I came here to look, you know, for work and see what kind of um, film projects I might be able to get hired on. I was basically, basically looking to be hired. But when I got here, I learned that there was nothing happening, <laughs> really. <laughs> I did kind of like get a little bit of a, a, a receptionist job at one of the, um, like the IBC, you know, Broadcasting Corporation and their business arm, ICSL. Um, but really, really quickly, I learned that if I wanted to be in the film industry, I was going to have to start being the ones creating, being the one creating the project. Um, so it started off small, like just getting small pockets of money from like GN um, Culture and Heritage or Clay at the time and um, just pulling together small pockets of money um, for, for different kinds of projects. Um, and then just doing that over the years, the projects have continuously just gotten bigger and bigger. Um, but it really did kind of start off small and me needing to, or realizing that if we were going to work in this, if I was going to work in this industry, that I would have to be producing, basically. Um, so just going back to what you were saying earlier, like there's so much, there is so much business to this world and this industry. Um, yes, lots of creativity and um, creative talent and all of that stuff, but really also very importantly is that business aspect and being able to write your proposals and learn how to like being able to pitch them in a way, whether it's on paper or in person to the people who are, have the money, you know, who are looking to buy your idea um, mm -hmm. and that part's not easy. Like I still struggle with it, but we're, Alethea and I are doing constant verbal pitches these days because we're in the midst of um, project development, which is the topic of this webinar. And like, it's, it's not easy, even though we've been doing it for so long, I still get nervous and I still have to like, kind of like pep myself up and, and try to take deep breaths and be calm and really try to convince them that our idea is the one that they want to invest in. <laughs> How about you, Alethea? How did you get started? Um, I was just looking for a summer job and got hired as an assistant editor on a documentary because all the footage was in Inuktitut and the editor only spoke English. So they needed someone to take all the translations and type them up and put them on like as subtitles on the footage. Um, so I speak Inuktitut, but I'm not super, super fluent. So I wouldn't have been able to just translate it myself, but because I had all the translations I just had to type them up and like place them correctly and I could understand enough to place them. And that process was fascinating, like really tedious doing subtitling for months uh, on end. But um, I got to sit and listen to elders talk and understand what they say because I had translations. So like typed up translations. So if I didn't understand, I could refer to what was being said and like it was just a you know, because I had been away from home for school for a number of years, it was a real chance to uh, relearn some Inuktitut, to hang out with elders that I never really got to hang out with before, um, even though, I mean, they weren't hanging out with me, I was just hanging out listening to them talk because it was video. Um, so I just fell in love with that process. Um, I had never watched too many documentaries before working on one and um, I was instantly like, wow, I love this. Um, I was in art school at the time, studying um, illustration. So I was drawing and painting every day. But uh, as soon as I got the experience of working on a documentary film, I fell in love with the whole idea of documentary film and never looked back. Like I, I've, I continued school and I finished it and graduated. But um, as soon as I graduated, I went home and um, started my own little <laughs> tiny company which was just me for 13 years <laughs> uh, i didn't have staff it was just me so the company wasn't like you know a place or anything it was just me in my living room on my couch for 14 years 
um, and occasionally traveling out and hiring people to shoot with me or produce with me or whatever. But um, I was just on my own until last year when you and I officially joined forces and opened our company together. Um, but it was it was like as soon as I watched the process of making a documentary film, it was a Khalunaq writing and directing and editing and producing and all that. They were all Khalunaq men, older Khalunaq men. And I was just like, man, what they're doing, I could do that. And I love it. Uh, I could totally do this. So I was like, you know, um, I want to do this and I want to know about this. And I want like listening to someone ask elders questions. I had so many questions. I wanted to ask the questions. I wanted to be the one in the chair choosing what was being talked about and like, what was I dying to know? Um, and man, they're just asking the wrong questions. They don't even know what to ask. Like, I, I want to ask the questions. Um, just looking around like, is this who gets to ask the questions? Um, and that's what really spurred me to um, get into documentary filmmaking. Cause basically every elder I was listening to, I was like, they know so much. I wonder if they know anything about Inuit tattoos because <laughs> it's what I really, really wanted to um, know about. And like in, even in my drawing classes at, at uh, college, I would like draw portraits of myself with tattoos and, and all that. I was kind of obsessing at that stage of my life um, already. And that's what basically ended up being my first film that I did. I took a um, proposal writing workshop that was delivered here in Iqaluit and um, I was learning how to write funding proposals but I didn't know what film I wanted to make and um, someone said to me, uh, I heard you're interested in getting new tattoos and you're researching them and stuff so why don't you make a film about that and I was just like, um, I mean, I'm interested in them, but I don't know if I want to write and direct a film about me getting tattoos. That's weird. But then IU Peter was there and in that workshop and she said to me, so you're doing all this research and learning about this thing that is not documented. So nobody has written it down or filmed it or anything. You're going to do all that research, learn all that beautiful knowledge, and then you're just going to keep it to yourself. How selfish. <laughs> And I was like, oh, damn, yeah. I guess if I'm going to research a subject that very few young people know anything about, I should document it and share it with other people so that it benefits somebody besides me. And that was the start of the Dunit documentary. Mm -hmm. And like you did that at a time where, um, you know, I mean, none of what our film industry is still developing and it's still growing, but like we're today in a much, much better position than we were 14 years ago when we were trying to start out. Um, the funding programs that Nunavut Film had weren't as like um, expansive, like, whereas, you know, today now we can, uh, we can apply to do a short film and, you know, and there's a beginning, beginner streams and, and then the bigger pot of money for big, huge, like feature films and big projects. Um, so there's such, like there's so much more support and like what was it like for you back then 14 years ago <laughs> as a person just uh, like trying to get this documentary off the ground yeah well <laughs> actually I mean we met 14 years ago but my first um editing job on a on a doc was in 2003 so that was 17 years ago um and Nunavut film didn't even exist yet <laughs> so Ooh. yeah there was like there was no there was nothing yet and um like the first step was applying for some money from the GN because Nunavut film didn't exist yet so we would apply with projects directly to it's ed &T now but back then I think it was like environment and sustainable development or something the department like even the gn departments weren't the same um the government of nunavut was pretty new like it was all developing so none of that existed yet the film policy didn't exist and 
it was a different world than today where at least um, the government of Nunavut and even Canada is starting to recognize the importance of indigenous people telling their own stories. But at that time, there was none of that attitude. It was just like, why should we care about what you care about? And I remember pitching um, to make a documentary about traditional Inuit tattoos and people were like, but why do I care? Um, and like literally those are the words that would people would use to me. Um, like, why, why should I care? And that sounds kind of heartless, but like, it's actually a question you get asked a lot as a filmmaker and producer. Um, they're not trying to be harsh. They're just saying, okay, when people all over the country or all over the world watch this, why are they going to care about your story? Um, what's going to feel um, uh, familiar to them? What are they going to relate to? How are they going to connect and be like, yeah, I get that. Like, I felt like that in my life before, or, you know, it, it's, it sounds like a harsh question, especially when you're starting out and you're not used to people being like, why should I care about you? Um, it can feel really harsh to get feedback or questions like that. And you have to be ready to be treated like, I don't care about you. Convince me why I should care about you and what you have to say or what you have to film and show. Um, and that's something in development that you have to be um, okay with being questioned like that. And it's not an attack. It's not like you're not important. They're just asking, tell me what I'm going to connect to as if you were like some random person who doesn't give a crap about who you are and where you're from. Cause there's lots of them. Why are they going to suddenly be interested in what you have to show? And you just have to be confident in, um, why your story is interesting and it yeah. it was a very different time then it's a very different time now but it's still um sometimes an uphill battle to explain why um things that are important to us sh should be made and shown like at that time um like we didn't we didn't have like lots of young people have tattoos now and they like at that time there was no young people there was one last elder uh she was 104 years old and she had a face tattoo and like m most of my friends had never even heard of inuit tattoos before it was like a almost dead custom and um like the TV broadcasters and funders had no idea. They're like, lots of people get tattoos. Why does this matter? They didn't know the whole history of how they were almost wiped out and how colonization and Christianity and all of that had like suppressed this part of our culture and um, how we as a people in right now are trying to reclaim who we are as a people and our identity and our language and everything that like, like they had no idea. They were just like, so tattoos, lots of people get tattoos. Why is this important? Uh, why should I care? And it was up to me to say, well, there, it's a almost wiped out tradition, our standards of beauty and what we think is beautiful and um, important is completely different from your culture. Like they didn't know any of that. I had to explain it. Uh, and there's one last living elder with face tattoos. And that was like, they're like, oh, whoa, that's interesting. Um, an almost lost tradition that a young person is trying to to catch and hold on to before the last 104 year old elder dies they were like okay I get it that that's an interesting story um, unfortunately that elder passed away before I could film with her she had agreed to let me fly in and film with her and then she passed away and I was devastated like oh no, all that knowledge is lost. My film will never get made. I'll never learn about tattoos and I should just give up. And I was depressed for like a year. <laughs> um, but eventually I realized that um, there's still knowledge out there, even if there weren't elders with like face tattoos anymore, there were still lots of elders that knew about them. And I decided to continue with the project um, and travel and interview people. Um, it was just a little bit harder than I thought it would be. Um, and that's the other thing about development is like, honestly, in the course of making a film, you want to give up like 10,000 times. Um, like, honestly, 10,000 times, <laughs> multiple times a day, you're like, I should give up. Um, and then 
and then that's why the films that get made are usually things that people really care about and are passionate about because you have to be a little bit crazy and stubborn to get a film made. Mm. The other question that I find like we get asked a lot and it's like, what is the, um, why you, why are you the one that should be telling this story? And again, it's not like a, like an attack or something or, you know, something that you have to be defensive about, but it is a tricky question because it's like, why me? Well, I mean, I'm the one pitching it to you. So like, I don't know. (laughs) (laughs) But it's also an interesting question, even in the context. And I don't think it's meant to be used in this context of like, you know, why are, why were you the one that should have been, you know, the one telling the story about traditional tattoos versus, you know, I wonder what a white man would have said if he was asked that question, <laughs> if he wanted to make a documentary on it. <laughs> um, oh, we know what they, you know, we know what they say, because we've seen them pitch it about other things. It's like, I have this unprecedented access to these mystical, magical native people who barely know anything about internet in the world. And I'm like the cultural translator between them and us. And like, they, there's all kinds of bullshit that's said. Um, no, it's a really good question, though. That's a good point, because sometimes you're not the right person to tell a story. And you have to be careful there. Um, mm-hmm. So, for example, on Angry you know, it was all about seal hunting and how Inuit are affected by animal rights activists, right? And I had this time where I was like, do I have the right to make this film? I'm not a seal hunter. Um, I'm not a hunter at all. Would it be more appropriate for a man or somebody who goes hunting more to make this film than me? Um, but I mean, at the time, there weren't that many uh, Inuit filmmakers directing, you know, feature documentaries. It was like Zach and me. Um, Jolene had made the Elder series. Um, there were some TV shows, but like, you know, it's like, who's going to make this if, if I don't make this? Um, and I actually asked an elder, like, is this even my place? Why should I, you know, this is my relative. And I was like, who am I to talk about this issue? I'm not a seal hunter. I'm not selling seal skins. It's not my thing. And she said, "It the men just go hunting and kill it. It's the women who do all the work. Um, you know, the men will keep hunting no matter what. It's the women who are losing the money from selling seal skin things that they sell. So this is absolutely a women's issue. It completely opened my eyes to perspective that multiple people can be affected by something. And if I have a passionate interest in something, it's probably coming from somewhere and to think through, okay, as it's, you know, it just cause I'm a woman doesn't mean I don't have a right to tell this story. And, um, like I have thought about men are, men are affected. I'm not a seal hunter. I need to talk to a seal hunter. And that's why I went out and filmed with men who seal hunt and sell the skins on a regular basis. It was important to get their point of view and make sure I'm filming with them and not just saying what I think. So like, who are you to tell this story is a really important question. Um, You need to be ready to answer it. And if there are parts of the issue or story that you're not an expert on, go find the experts and talk to them. It doesn't mean you can't make a film about it. It just means you need to talk to people who are more knowledgeable than you. What would you say um, is the number one tip that you would give to someone um, who is interested in making their first documentary film, whether it be a broadcast hour or a 10 minute documentary sort of thing what would your number one tip be or advice? First of all, start with a 10 minute documentary. (laughs) You did not do that, Alicia. I did not do that. That's why it's my first piece of advice because I didn't do that and it nearly killed me. And you were there, you know that I almost like, oh my God, (laughs) I wanted to like quit life and I thought I was going to be put in jail for messing up with the funding so badly and not doing the reporting right because I didn't know how, you know. Anyway, (laughs) um, start small. Do something small. 
find what you're passionate about. You can, you can be working on developing your big dream project. You can do that for years, but while you're getting ready and working on that, also work on something really small, 10 minutes. I'm going to call somebody and do a zoom interview about a subject I'm interested in. Make that, edit it, put music to it, put end credits, put it online, like do it, just do it start small start with no money just do things make things make videos over and over again with small things and then um apply for some for some funding some smaller amount of funding with one of the entry level programs at Nunu film and make a short documentary like start small and um and then like learn what you don't know so that you can get better at it and be ready for your big dream super important project cuz sometimes you can bite off more it's easy to bite off more than you can chew and that's what i did and it nearly killed me so i wish i started smaller i wish i did some short films first um but when i started like you know vimeo didn't exist youtube was there but like people weren't self-publishing um no no film didn't exist like it was it was a different world and now we have these things like now it's like when <laughs> when i started phones couldn't take videos <laughs> that's how old i am um <laughs> so we couldn't just make our own short films without a real video camera you know like it just it cost the money back then it cost real money back then to make a film and publish it and put it out yourself like you couldn't just do that and now we can so i think if i was like born in a different time i probably would have done a short film first but because it was like to do any film you had to like go for a national broadcast license i bit off more than i could chew and it almost killed me so take advantage of the time that you're in that you can do short films on your own and start there um and like honestly don't be afraid of making bad films i was terrified and like really tried so hard to make films that i thought were excellent and and like um important and like i was so worried about not making a great film on my first shot and it was dumb because like just like with my drawing classes i had to get used to making lots and lots of crappy drawings and eventually i got better and was able to make good drawings um and i didn't i didn't um transfer that knowledge and practice over into my filmmaking and um it caused a lot of stress for me that was unnecessary like go make crappy short films um and you will eventually make great short films and great longer films um just don't be afraid to mess up and make something that's not perfect that's a good note like we try to be so precious i think and i struggle with that too is um you know in development right now trying to you know write things but then second guessing myself and like not trusting myself is it good is it funny enough what like you know all of these things and then i end up sometimes just deleting the things not without even giving them a shot to shine um and it's definitely something that i have to kind of get over is if it came out um give it a shot and see what happens and it so much of what i've already like been writing is like on the cutting room floor already <laughs> you know like pages and pages and pages pages we pages and we have shared a google doc and i've watched you like delete 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 and i'm like stop it that was really good and you're like oh <laughs> <laughs> so just being able to like yeah that note of just don't be precious i'm i'm trying to practice it even right now um years of doing this work and i'm still trying to to learn how to not second my second guess myself too much and just kind of give it a shot throw it out there see what happens if people don't respond to it then maybe like think park it somewhere else maybe it's not maybe it doesn't fit there in this scene but it could actually really shine in a different scene or in a different way sort of thing so like um to not feel like you're failing because something that you created doesn't hit strongly and perfectly off of that first shot sort of thing makes you feel like you know 
just don't be precious. <laughs> yeah. It's been really fun to like, okay, so, I mean, you worked on staking the claim in Hanole for many years. And, uh, you know, I was doing really long, slow documentaries <laughs> with Dunit and Angry Inuk. And we both worked on like a bunch of other projects along the way, but, um, and now we're working on a comedy show together that's from Stacy's um, heart and like little bits of her life, little bits of my life, little bits of all of our friends' lives. So it's a fiction, but it's kind of, um, inspired by the world around us. It's like, yeah. Yeah, inspired by the world around us. Exactly. But like, you know, it was your concept that you really birthed and, um, um, <laughs> and like it was your your concept that you brought and brought a whole bunch of us on board and we've all been like contributing to it but it's your baby and it's been really fun to watch um and take part in the development of it in a way that I never have before because I've been mostly documentary and looking at real life and like filming things and then editing and trying to figure out what the story is afterward as you've like you film it you have a sense of what the story is and then you film things and you're like, oh, I thought the story was this, but not, but now that I see the footage, it's like there's a different little bit of a different story in there than I thought. Whereas when you're working in fiction, it's really like you're creating it and you are like really, really carefully, thoughtfully creating it before you ever turn on a camera. And it's a very different process from what I'm used to in documentary. And it's, it's funny because this creative writing process and pitching it and trying to convince funders and broadcasters to take interest in, in it is really like there's a lot of rejection of ideas and support of ideas and debate and discussion. Um, and like in my experience, this is what somebody would do or say. And like, you know, there's just a lot of um, back and forth between different people on the idea. And to me, normally, as a documentary filmmaker, that's what happens in the editing room once you've already filmed, when you're deciding what to keep, what to cut out, and what to focus on. Um, and it, the fiction world is so different, and it's been really fun to, to learn um, from you in this process, because fiction is not my, it's not where I started, and it's, it's like, it's been your world for several years, so it's been really, um, yeah, huge learning experience to go through the process. But even for you, I mean, even after working for, on Hanola for so many years, this is a different experience, right? It is. I mean, you know, one of the things when you're developing a project to, um, whether it's documentary or or fiction, is you know you have to ask yourself um, who's like who's your who's my audience? Who is this story for? And um, coming from Kanogli, this was a very, this TV show was for Inuit. We didn't have to, you know, we could just, we didn't have to explain certain things. We could just know that people will get it because this show is for Inuit. Um, and thankfully, like a lot of it still translated to the outside world and um, Kanogli, you know, did get an audience in Southern Canada and People were interested in it um, just organically, but in this process that we're going through right now, where we're trying to make a show that is um, commercial, it's marketable to not just Inuit. First and foremost, I always write for Inuit. I want to create stories that Inuit can watch and be like, yes, ha, that's so true, that's right, that's, that's funny because there's like little... Um, stuff there that is really meant for us and we get it um, but trying to make it translate to such a like a wider audience as well like why would a white person in the south also want to watch this we need to make it interesting and funny also for them and um, relatable in certain ways for them um, something that they really want to tune into so it's an interesting balance that we're trying to make right now like create with this show it's like yes we want Inuit to watch this and feel like this is this is our world and we can definitely tell that that writer and creator is Inuk um and while also trying to get these bigger broadcasters to invest in in a story like this so it's not easy and I mean we're 
we're sharing a Google Doc writing right now and, you know, I write a joke sort of thing. And Alethea laughs because she gets it immediately. It was really funny. I thought it was really clever to use the, the you know, joke I'm talking about, the 60% in the South. Yes. <laughs> and, then, yes. and then we have to have a conversation, like, would people in the South get it? Like, it's, there is so much, like, layered context on a joke like that. Um, you know, it's talking about the education system here. Um, you know, how Inuit are treated in an, in an education system that's you know built in a western way like it's just so layered that we were like i don't think people point people would or people from the south would get the joke and so we're like okay mm -hmm. maybe that's not the right joke then for this this moment um but maybe it can be in the future if we you know end up having a real show and we get t t 13 episodes maybe people would understand it by the 13th episode because they've invested in our world, they've invested in the characters and they've been able to um, absorb, you know, this completely new community, this completely new way of life and thinking and seeing how Inuit interact with each other sort of thing. Maybe they would get it by the 13th episode, but it is for sure like a, a challenge of trying to figure out that balance. Um, any kind of like last thoughts or words to anybody who might end up watching this kind of chat between us and who might be interested because I mean we've been doing some workshops around Nunavut and it's been so great to see how full these workshops have been and like there's definitely an interest there for sure so hopefully we'll get a few people tuning into this and we're going to do a QA and a um, as well after this goes live um, but what would you say, Alethea, as your parting words to Inuit who might be interested in making movies or docs or films? You go first. <laughs> um, okay. Um, I guess I'll, something I wish I had done, um, and this is very um, fiction. I guess oriented, but not necessarily because you mentioned you did this as well when you um, were creating your docs um, that you, and I, oh, I totally remember you doing this actually. And you went out and you watched as many docs as possible sort of thing. Um, um, watch TV, like I, I like television. It's my kind of my world and my passion. I love long form storytelling and going on long journeys with characters and watching their their journeys evolve and how they change and what happens in their lives. I love long form storytelling. So I watched a lot of TV. Like it's no joke. I'm like, I'm working. Like sometimes I watch them to enjoy. But like if I really enjoyed a certain TV show, I go back and I like, I actually try to find scripts for it. I read the scripts and I kind of study it a little bit. Like I didn't go to film school. So this was me just kind of doing research and really trying to understand what was it about this TV show that I really liked? Why does it stand out for me compared to the other TV show where I watched one episode and I never watched anything else? What did they do wrong in their pilot or whatever? Um, and one thing I really wish that I did too um is because we don't have a lot of we still don't have a lot of productions up here unfortunately um so it's not like we can just very easily go and get a job if we're interested in this work um so you kind of have to take your learning into your own hands um to make it up here and that's really important to do google stuff find scripts watch movies study them um, but as I was saying, the one thing I wish that I'd done earlier is there's something called a spec script. So when you go out and you just kind of find your favorite TV shows, um, just write an episode for it, pretending like you already know all the characters because you love them, you know what they would do, you know how they joke, you, you know, because you've gone on that journey with them, write a pretend episode for them. 
no one ever has to see it, but it gives you practice kind of understanding a structure, a story structure, whether it's a, a one hour TV show or a half an hour TV show. And, um, and then they can end up being things that you have in your portfolio, whether or not like no one sees them, like nobody ever has to see them. Or if you're coming to a point in your career where unfortunately there haven't been a lot of productions up here. So you don't have a portfolio of your work, but you can show like I've taken my learning into my own hands and here's my, here's a few scripts that I've written for Brooklyn Nine-Nine or, or Dawson's Creek. I don't know. Why did I say Dawson's Creek? That was the first thing that I thought of. <laughs> <laughs> Embarrassing shit. <laughs> um, but, <laughs> but yeah, take, take your learning into your own hands and Thankfully, we're in a position now where, you know, Alethea has a lot of experience. I like, we're still building our experience, but we're here now. And we're going to see more and more people in this industry than we can support each other and work with each other. But yeah, that would be my number one tip, I think, is that if you're wanting to learn, go online, learn, watch YouTube videos, watch videos like the one we're doing right now and just be in charge of your own kind of like education and learning. Mm -hmm. That's really good advice. And um, I guess what I would add to it is actually something I learned from you too, is um, finding like the shows you love, looking up who wrote and created them or produced them or directed them whether it's like comedy or romantic dramas or documentaries or whatever, looking up the creators and finding interviews with them talking about um, their process and what they've done. And um, I, ne I had never really done that. My version of that was like getting my ass to film festivals and um, watching films. Um, huge learning tool um especially in documentary because they're not on tv as much i like i really because i was making documentary films i got to go to film festivals too and i'd watch um documentaries as much as i could and learn from how they're made and but then like really useful was watching the q and a's um after the film showed so the director would stand on stage and the audience would ask questions and you'd hear about their process of making the film that was a really big learning experience for me and like what you just like what i saw you doing finding youtube videos of of, of creators show tv show creators doing that on youtube videos was a, a learning tool for me like I, I hadn't done that before so that was really useful for me to learn that from you um that you don't have to have the money or funding or support to go to a film festival to learn from filmmakers. You can now find videos of them online. Like, I mean, there are even videos of me online doing Q and A's for, for my documentaries. So like, you know, there's uh, whether you're in Oak, there are film in Oak filmmakers on YouTube doing Q and A's for their films. There are um, other indigenous, like look up indigenous filmmakers. There's lots of um, great, like, you know, even the Globe and Mail and Toronto Star, like uh, Canadian newspapers do top 10 lists of Indigenous filmmakers every year or every couple of years, especially in Canada 150, they made all kinds of like lists of great Indigenous films to watch and Indigenous filmmakers and shows and all that. And like, if you Google that stuff, you can find the content to watch and you can also find the cr the creators of that content and look them up and find their Twitter feeds um, can often be useful learning spaces of Indigenous storytellers and um, and finding their YouTube Q&As can also be really um, great place to learn because I find like um, I mean yeah, watch all your favorite content and the creators of them. But there's also like people that are very specifically like you from small communities or um, uh, remote places or specific languages. Like there's such specific niches that you can find online as well as mainstream like American content. And like being a nerd about it all is a really good thing. And um, yeah, you, you taught me a lot about self-learning that way 
we leave it there and hopefully we have people tune in and people can ask us direct questions and yeah Hey, everybody. <laughs> um, I see a couple questions about tattoos and as much as I could talk about that all day long and do often. Actually, we talk about that a lot. We were just talking about it today. <laughs> we're like in quarantine and basically we work together in the afternoons in our office. So we're an extension of our houses here in Nunavut, which is COVID-19 free <laughs> currently still. So we're like, should we just start tattooing each other? <laughs> But um, Alethea has made a wonderful documentary about it. And is that documentary available online, Alethea? It, it is, actually. It's not, like, just uh, super Googleable, but it, it, it is available on the Cinema Politica site. Um, cinema and then Politica is just, like, politic with an A at the end. Very straightforward. Um, it's on that site that it can be booked for group viewings, but you can also find it on Vimeo on the Cinema Politica account um and stream it on there so i ask people to watch that film before asking me questions because a lot of us questions are are answered in the film um so rather than repeat the same answers over and over again i mean it's why we make films <laughs> um so i'd be happy to talk more about tattoos if you reach out after that um and then i see a question about script writing for documentaries um, from from Jamie, is it different from how it's different from um, narrative or drama? Um, I mean, I've I've worked in documentary for a while, but I like I, I took years to make each one because, as I was saying in the video, um, selling the ideas took a long time, so I haven't gotten to make too many. Um, that said, um, I have my my sort of process. I've also um, gotten to become friends with some incredible documentary filmmakers over the course of my career as well, and, and they have different processes. Um, I kind of, I have snippets. I have a lot of like notes on my phone in the notes app. I have Word docs scattered throughout my computer. Um, Actually, I shouldn't say scattered, I'm totally lying. I'm actually really organized with my computer. I'm not an organized person in physical life, but on my computer, I'm ruthless. I date all my documents by year, dash month, dash day, so that I can find things. Um, and I keep notes and folders, uh, like I have a folder of like potential story ideas or things I'm obsessing about that may or may not be a film or an article or a feature film or a TV series or, or even just a thread in a completely, you know, um, unrelated TV series that's not about a certain issue, but it could become a useful thread in, in a story. So I just kind of have um, word docs, many word docs of different uh, story ideas that I obsess about. Um, so for example, with Angry Inuk, um, it wasn't called that initially. It, I had the very first word doc I had for that idea was War with Greenpeace. That was the title. <laughs> um, and it was just a few lines saying, what if IU joined Greenpeace and tried to take them down from the inside? <laughs> um, <laughs> I remember. Badass. <laughs> I remember vividly asking her, I was, I gave, gave her a ride home from somewhere and um, I asked her in the car, I worked up the nerve to ask her if she'd be willing to join Greenpeace. Oh, hey, can you see us now? <laughs> um, I asked Ayu if she would join Greenpeace and try to take them down from the inside and she said, fuck no. <laughs> that was her answer. I was like, okay, okay. So I kind of had to like rejig my idea and um, come, you know, it, it just made me think about, okay, if it's not like the cheeky thing of joining Greenpeace when you disagree with everything that they do, um, what's the story here? And I really struggled for years pitching um, the project. People would say, say to me, okay, I get that the issue is important, but what am I going to see? 
and it really took me a long time to wrap my head around what they meant. Um, and then I realized, you know, truly, visually, what are you going to see? So this issue is important. Yes, it's an important staple food for us. It's unfair what the uh, European Union has done and the, the Americans have done in affecting how we can trade in seal skins. But everything I just said has no visual with it. So I started writing down point form, like, what's the first opening shot I want to see? I want to see uh, a flow edge. I want to see a grandfather and grandson hunting. And so I just kind of like visually storyboarded, um, uh, or sorry, imagined the storyboard of the film and then wrote down point form um, what that was. And I just over time filled it in and rearranged things and expanded on things. Sometimes even put um, like clippings, newsp newspaper headlines or links to articles in there. Um, so that could represent a section of the film that I didn't have time or didn't have the headspace to write out yet. I would just put in like a link to an article in my like draft treatment for the for the documentary and um, that would remind me to go back and write a section about that was like either inspired by or about what was in the article um, or photos and you just kind of throw it in and um, I I was so concerned with writing it out and then I saw a talk um, on a uh, like a panel discussion at a imaginative film festival one year where Lisa Jackson, um, one of my favorite documentary filmmakers on the planet, um, talked about her process and she said initially she was a writer and so uh, she had trouble thinking visually and I was like, whew, it's not just me. <laughs> um, I felt su such a relief that this incredible filmmaker really struggled to think visually at first. Um, so what she would do is just like, um, she'd write like a poem or like a, a, you know, stream of consciousness in a section. And then she'd have like um, drawings. She just kind of like visually storyboarded it. So I, I learned that process from her. Um, and she's, she, so her first documentary ended up being a really fascinating and unusual mixture of like, animation and live action and text and artwork like it was really visually textured and and fascinating and it came from her being a writer and um so she wrote out everything she wanted and then attached images whatever the images were that made sense to what was written um that's what the film ended up being so she started from an intellectual written place and then attached imagery and it ended up being wildly interesting and different. Um, and then some people just think in pictures um, and, and they can do that. So there's no really, um, I think with, with story treatments for documentary, there are fewer rules than there are for fiction. Um, I'm only like recently getting into the world of writing fiction. Stacy dragged me kicking and scre screaming into that. And it's so different. <laughs> There's like methods and things people do that you don't mess with and like, that's how you do it. <laughs> so I embarrass myself constantly. Um, I mean, I think so much of, I, and I, again, not coming from so, so much of a doc background, but like so much of your writing, I feel like takes place in the edit room. Like that's where you're actually writing. That's mm -hmm. when you have all of the pieces of your story and then you get to lay them out and organize them and, and magically write it um, on your editing system. Whereas with fiction, it's um, you're writing it all before you even shoot anything. Sort of. Yeah. And when you brought me into your writing room, as we were coming up a story and thinking of the story story arc and where conflicts are and which characters do what and do we need more of this energy here and that energy there, it really reminded me of editing a documentary. Mm -hmm. I was so intimidated by the fiction writing process. And then at some point I was like, oh, okay, this is like, this is like editing doc, mm -hmm. but you do it at, yeah. Front, like, yeah. at the beginning. I mean, I think one of the reasons why Alethea like has become such a great, as much experience in, um, as in fiction as she's mentioned, but because of her doc background and being able to, to take all of these different pieces 
of story elements. They're like a puzzle that you have to fit together super perfectly and make it make sense and make it make people emotionally react to it and feel something when they're watching it. She has all of that experience with her because of documentary. She's put together puzzles in terms of storytelling before. And so I think documentary and, and fiction aren't necessarily that different at the end of the day. Yeah, it's true. The story editing is like, what are you really trying to say with this project? What, what are the things that you obsess about that keep coming to the surface? What are the emotions you want people to feel at this mm -hmm. moment in the film? What are you feeling? What do you want your audience to be feeling? And when do you want um, the surprises to come and the reveals to happen? It's all, that's it's all, all very storytelling. Similar. It's all the same. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just different um, pace and different organization which is logistical mostly, yeah. but when it comes to the creative heart of it, it's very much, it comes from the same place. First time I was um, directing a, anything in fiction as a documentary filmmaker, I was like, this feels like cheating. People <laughs> do and say what you want them to, what you tell them to. This is so cheating. <laughs> Editing's gonna be so easy. You, it you, is. you just like put it together and it's like exactly what you wanted. And then we edit and then it's like really fucking hard. But um, but in the in the moment it is it is, like, is a little bit easier in the editing room, but you're coordinating a lot more um, people when it's a fiction versus a documentary. Yeah. It's a whole like bigger team. Well, There's pros and cons and challenges and yeah. yeah. Well, people are more forgiving of like time jumps and jump cuts and like things like that with documentary. <laughs> it's just like, it's a doc, whatever. But with fiction, it's like, you have to be perfect, so. All right, um, what training would be of the most benefit to filmmakers in the territory? How to do your taxes? Um, I mean, I think one of the things that um, got Alethea to where we, Alethea and I to where we are right now is because we very slowly, painstakingly, full of mistakes, learn how to produce our own projects. At the end of the day, there are, we have lots of ideas, there's lots of creativity and no shortage of stories and storytellers, um, but we need people who know how to raise the money, how to manage the projects and help help people be creative and help people tell their stories. So we, I think, I would personally say that we need more producers, um, you. you need producers, and I would then say, just give it a shot, start with something small, produce your own project, or help, um, help someone that you think has an incredible storytelling voice, and let them be the director and the writer, and you be the producer, or you produce your own story, whatever it is, I think it's important to really get your feet wet in the business side of it. Um, because that's what's going to make our, our industry flourish is the producers at the end of the day, I think. Yeah. Agreed. Also, we need more sound people. <laughs> <laughs> it's a constant thing. So if you don't have access to produ producers, be your own producer, start your own small project. If you do have access to producers, um, in your community or your city, whether you're from Nuke, I see there's some people from Greenland here. Um, see if they like get a job on their next production. If you're from Nakaluit, talk to us. Obviously, we're not in production right now, um, but hopefully we will be in the near future. But reach out, make sure that they know that you're interested in this field and in this career and um, start there. Do you ever watch Greenlandic films? Have they ever been a source of inspiration? Oh my gosh. Yes. <laughs> I have one of um, <laughs> my first movie that I ever watched was Kakat Alangui, the horror film. I remember watching it like, I don't, it was like probably five years ago now, and it inspired one of our. I don't know if anybody, if you've watched Kanoli, but we kind of do, we were very inspired by the TV show Community. Um, where they do theme episodes and we really took that on for our show Kanogli because we thought of it as such a great opportunity to learn different styles of filmmaking so we could have a an episode that was like there's a conspiracy and there's going to be a skidoo chase and a, or a car chase or the bylaw is trying to track someone down and so we have to shoot it like that and we, we have to have that dramatic edge and that comedy with it or the next episode might be um, a horror film. So I, I know that 
Hakat along we definitely inspired one of our one of our episodes. <laughs> Um, I didn't know a lot of Greenlandic film until relatively recently. Like when I was starting out, I basically knew about Zacharias Gunuk and that was it. <laughs> um, and then, of course, like IBC shows like Kukubina and all that, but Kanogle wasn't around yet when I was starting out. Um, so I, I, it wasn't an inspiration in my earlier years just because I didn't know about it, but now it's like, I see the stuff that Greenland is coming out with and I'm like, oh, I need to step up my game. Yeah. <laughs> They're doing incredible work over there. We're starting to work with some Greenlanders, which is really exciting to be working across the colonial borders and partnering with our own people that are like just over there. Um, so yeah, we love Greenland. We, we want to go there as much as we can. <laughs> and um, I think it would be really fun to someday exchange more of our work. like. I I know that you guys have KNR there. We have IBC, and definitely important to like bridge that gap and share content with each other more, so that we can be yeah. mutually inspired yeah. more and more and more. They yeah. have such strong theater uh, training over in Greenland, and they have so many good actors and really strong language and music. Mm -hmm. Oh my god, the music. Alethea and I have like come up with entire plots of <laughs> us moving to Nuuk, <laughs> learning Kalashli <laughs> Sut. <laughs> All and the then professional reasons. All the professional reasons, and then come back to Kaluit and like. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We're, we're always scheming to try to get over there, so yeah. Uh, okay. I only have a very intuitive way myself with a very skeletal script, and then build a film along the way. You know, Jamie, it's uh, for documentary script writing, it's. Um, Sometimes it feels like you're bullshitting, to be honest, because it feels you like you're bullshitting shot. all the time. <laughs> no, no matter what genre. No, no matter, matter what genre. But especially when you're writing for a treatment for a documentary that you haven't shot yet. You can't control real life. It can be impossible to know what's going to happen. And, and it feels really, like, it really made me uncomfortable when I was starting out. How the hell do you write a script for real life? Like, you don't know what's going to happen. Um, but, and then sometimes, sometimes you do kind of have to bullshit, like just guess at what could happen and make it a good score story. Basically your treatment just needs to show that you know how to tell a good story. And even if what you hope will happen or you think might happen doesn't, the fact that you wrote a treatment that's a good story and is intriguing and has a beginning, middle and end and has good characters and keeps you interested the whole way through, that shows your skill set. And then it's, it, it can be really surprising what you pull out of yourself. Like I was just telling Stacy um, while you all were watching the video that the angry you know, treatment that I wrote many years ago, I watched the final film and then I went back to the treatment and I was shocked at how exact the treatment was. Like eight years, ten years apart? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think I wrote the final treatment like a few years in, but, but it was years later in the edit suite, I went back and looked at the story treatment and I was shocked at how close it was to what I imagined the film would be. Because I made a film about my home community, about an issue that's important to me that I grew up with. I know the world, like, you know, I, I, I kind of, it seemed a bit miraculous some of the things that I guessed would happen, but in, in a sense it wasn't because I can guess what's gonna happen because I'm from here and I know the world. So, um, it's, it can be half bullshit as long as it's a good story and nobody expects your story to, to stay um, exactly what your treatment says is going to happen, but um, it needs to communicate the tone you're going to be going for, the visual style, the, um, you know, what's the perspective that's coming from here? Is this a serious thing? Is it, is there narration? Like people need to have some sense of what kind of uh, film you're trying to make because as we've discovered over the years, it's amazing how specific the broadcasters are um, about what they're looking for in the moment. They might be like, you know what? I don't want anything to do with food right now. I don't want any food documentaries, nothing. And then they can be like, unless there's some um, women-centric uh, things going on, like if there's anything to do with the women's role in film, in, in food, then, then that's something I'm interested in. It's, it's weird. Um, how specific broadcasters are and what they're looking for or more specifically not looking for. And that might often. change from year to year. So month one year, to month. month to month, 
So don't give up. Yeah. <laughs> it changes constantly. So we got so many, so many rejections. We still get rejections, hard rejections all the time. So um, you just keep at it and eventually, um, you know, the more you keep at it, the better it gets. So it's almost, almost never a bad thing when you get rejected, really. It's heartbreaking. It sucks. You have to figure out how you're going to live and work when you get rejected, but it, you know, more time to develop something that you're passionate about usually makes it better. All right. What do you remember mostly while making a documentary of film? Difficult situation, how can you best avoid or solve it? Mm. Mm. <laughs> Saucy <Ooh>. question. <laughs> Spicy. <laughs> um, I've been in some difficult situations. Um, some working on productions that I wasn't the director of, which is which was harder because when you're not the boss of something, you can't necessarily fix things. So I've been in situations where, you know, like a female crew member was being treated like shit and it was like, I wanted to scream and do something, but she was like, if you do anything right now, they'll kick, kick me off the shoot and I won't quit, get more jobs. It was like really, really mm. burned. Um, so that situation really taught me like, I want to be, in the situation where I can fire misogynists and racists. I just don't want to work with those kinds of people. And I felt so powerless in that situation to, um, you know, get rid of the person that was being really hurtful and demeaning. So um, that was one. And the solution for me was to bust my buns and as much as it killed me, learn how to produce, <laughs> um, to be able to raise my own funds, run my own project, do my own reporting, which I still suck at, but you know, Stacy's making me better. <laughs> Sorry, Hugh. <laughs> um, um, but you know, all those, all those business skills that don't come naturally to me that I have like emotional rejection of, um, really when you're an artist and you have something important to say and that you really, really want to say it in the way you want to say it, it's important to suck it up and get those business skills, um, um, strong enough to, for you to be able to produce your own work, especially as indigenous creators. Um, it's really disconcerting to be trying to tell a story and not necessarily have control. So I, I strongly encourage, um, minorities, um, people of color, women, just anyone who's not an old white guy to be producers on their own creative content whenever possible. Um, did I answer the question? <laughs> yeah. I think so. Oh, there's more down here. Thoughts on collect. Okay. I'm not Inuk, but I'd like to know about your thoughts on collaborating with other filmmakers like me developing a project that's an Inuit story. Thank you. Do you want to talk about that? Or yeah, I mean, it really depends, um, to be very honest. Um, I mean, for me right now, it, it, it depends on what's going on in my own career, like coming from a very personal space. It's like, right now I have a whole body of my own work and our own work that we're really trying to push forward. Um, so we're really focusing on stories that are coming from us or coming from our, our direct kind of uh, collaborators um, who are Inuk, Inuk mostly. But with that said, it's, we've collaborated with and worked with people outside of our community before multiple times. Um, so it really depends, I think, on timing. It depends on um, when, at what phase of the project you're in already. Um, I, I personally, and Alethea and I, I think we're pretty standard on this, is that we prefer to come in at a very early stage so that we actually have a say in story. Um, we've been approached multiple times and they're already like ready for pre-production. They just need a, you know, partners, so you know, and the story's written, the script is written, they might be open to some feedback, but really it's all there. They're just looking for, for ink names to attach to it. And I personally stay away from those projects now. Earlier in my 
my career, I was more open to it because I was really wanting the experience. Um, but the back downside of that is that when you're in that early stage of your career looking for experience, it's really easy to get put into uncomfortable situations, situations that you feel um, that you don't have enough power or knowledge to kind of navigate through. Um, so it's, it's tricky, but um, yeah, for me right now, I only get involved in projects with Inuit, with, or with a non-Inuit, where it's in the development phase, um, or at least very early on in, in the, the project creation. Yeah. Yeah, it's, I mean, it, it, it's the same for me. And my advice to um, other Inuit or Indigenous people trying to get into filmmaking, it would be very similar. Like, um, I might not be into jumping onto a project that's already really formed, um, but 20 years ago I would. And if I was just starting out today, yeah, if that's the only opportunity you have to get a foot in the door to kind of get a sense of what the filmmaking world is like, then I don't begrudge anybody for taking those opportunities at all. Um, just keep in mind that there are always people out there. I mean, when I say always, I mean always. We still get these requests all the time. I just got another one today. I haven't showed you the email yet. I'll show you after. <laughs> <laughs> um, where people basically are like, here's the idea I have. You're welcome. And um, just like in Moana, you know, he's like, you're welcome. <laughs> it's so amazing. And I'm giving you this incredible opportunity yeah, to work, to with, work me. with me. I've never made a film, but um, you're welcome. And um, it, it, it comes from a very outsider perspective and they just assume I'm happy for the opportunity to take part in their project. And it, they can be downright offensive. That said, there's another one I got yesterday that I told you about that, um, you know, it's, it's somebody who came to me and said, I'm obsessed with this issue and I've seen your work and enjoyed it. And, um, uh, you know, I, I don't know if this is an area that you're interested in, but I would love to collaborate with you someday. Is this a subject that you're interested in? And I really, really appreciated it. I've gotten, no kidding, hundreds and hundreds of messages from people wanting to collaborate. Like anytime a film, anytime a film gets an award or you're in the news for something, it's like you get this flurry of messages and they're just like, oh, a native person that might give me a rubber stamp on my project. Um, and I've honestly never gotten an email that was worded the way the one was yesterday. Oh, where nice. it, was, it was like, it wasn't even like, I want to make this film. Are you interested? It was like, here's an issue I'm interested in. I admire your work. I've done my research on you. I've done my research on this issue for a decade do you see a story in there that you would want to tell? And it was asking me whether I had a story I would like to tell in the material that they were presenting. And that was a fascinating and humble way to approach somebody. It was pretty awesome, actually. Um, but we're pickier because we've been at this for 15 years. So, um, you know, there's lots of people who are trying to um, make more films, get more experience. And we're also happy to connect people um, to other aspiring filmmakers or mid-career filmmakers if there's a project that we're not into but we think is worthwhile we're happy to try to make mm -hmm. connections as well so we're like occasionally leaning and squinting at the <laughs> um. you mentioned that when you make your films you keep in mind southern audiences what is, a, what is a Southerner in this context? Someone who is non-Arctic, non-Indigenous in Canada and the US, or do you hope, or do you hope to make a f film which speaks to audiences somewhere halfway across the globe? And if yes, what do you hope to communicate to them through your films? In the case of Angry Inuk, the messages are very clear. Could you talk about other films and your work in general? Mm -hmm. Um, well, when we say um, when we say Southerners, um, generally we're talking Southern Canadians, yeah. non Inuit, non Inuit Southern Canadians, generally white Southern Canadians. Not just white, just like just true, but, yeah. 
<laughs> Maybe we have different definitions of Southern. No, I, I, like I, anyone down I, I do, but I also feel like even minority people in the South probably have, we can relate to each other a little bit more than like the, than the general white Southern Canadian. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's just people anywhere where that live in trees almost. <laughs> yeah, basically the tree line. That's a really good one. Yeah, it's basically tree line south and that's a southern for us. People often get confused when I say southerner and they think we're talking about like Florida Texas or Texas. Or, yeah. yeah, Texas comes up a lot. <laughs> but we just mean tree line and south. Yeah. yeah. Um, but it's a good point because, um, and, and I'm glad, I'm really happy to say you, that it's really clear with Angry Eno because I had a very specific audience for that. And it was Southerners. It, it, of course, I'm making the film to help my people, but the audience, I was trying to change the minds of Southerners, but not just all Southerners. I had a very specific um, person in mind or type of person in mind. And it were, was people who felt they were so adamantly against the seal hunt, but could have their minds changed with some information. And so hardcore vegans, not going to bother people who are already uh, sympathetic, sympathetic to us, I don't need to change their mind. I needed to change the minds of people who were changeable, um, but felt really, really strongly opposed to the seal hunt, uh, which means they were also, um, like, they care about environmental issues, they care about animals, that's exactly They are the doing their research, yeah. but the research out there is all wrong because of the monopoly that PETA and other animal welfare groups. They want to be good people, mm -hmm. um, but also a slice of an audience that was, um, may not be hardcore, but consider themselves like intellectuals that can be convinced of an argument and like to be surprised and challenged. Um, so th those are the kinds of people that I thought of as I wrote the story treatment as we edited the film, deciding what to shoot, uh, writing the narration, which was brutally difficult. Uh, I was trying to make a film with no narration at all and it ended up being like all fucking narration. <laughs> wall to wall, it was so hard. I swear, it's my goal in life to make a film without narration. In it. I do remember <laughs> you making that, 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 cla that claim, that goal. It was just <laughs> impossible for me, but anyway. Um, especially in the narration. And you still like, have to welcome change like that too sometimes. Yeah. If it's better for the story, you know, it might not be the way, exactly the way you pictured it. Yeah. But you have to do what's best for it at the end of the day. You do, you do have to be specific though. Like I see a lot of beginners pitch um, their projects and they get asked who's your audience and they're like, I don't want everybody to see this. And it's like, yeah, but really <laughs> not everyone's going to watch it. And marketers, advertisers, broadcasters who have to sell to advertisers have to have a target audience in mind. And it's not even just about like the money and advertising in that, it's about clarity of story. So um, how much do you explain? We're coming from a world that has a small population and we're trying to tell a particular story that we wanna reach a larger audience. And in that case, um, are you explaining things to people who know nothing about the Arctic? Are you explaining things to people who know that residential schools existed or not? Are you explaining things to people who um, are Indigenous, so they actually know a lot about the Indigenous experience or um, the experience of not being white in a majority white country? Um, there really are target audiences and it affects not just how you market the film after, but how you write the show or film it really, really affects the dialogue, mm -hmm. uh, what kinds of things you show. So mm -hmm. you, you do have to have a specific audience in mind and it, there can be a few audiences. There, there can be different audiences, but you have to know what they are and what your priorities are and, and to decide who you're writing for. Mm -hmm. That makes me really, it's, it's completely not related, but it makes me wonder what Greenlanders call their Southerners. <laughs> 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 or like Alaskan Inuit, what do you call your southerners? <laughs> like Kaluna. <laughs> but in English, what do you call them? <laughs> uh, what can you say about films produced in Russian High North? What would you Ooh. recommend to watch? Oh, um, uh, my friend. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. Starts with an S. I'm completely blanking. There's an incredible um, filmmaker. Uh, Sardana, uh, Sardana, S-A-R-D-I-N-A, 
um, go on to my Facebook <laughs> and search my friends list for Sardana. Her 5,000 <laughs> friend list. <laughs> Don't scroll through it. Use the search bar. <laughs> um, she's the producer from Russia. She's indigenous um, from the Arctic. And um, she's really at the cutting edge of developing the industry in the Russian Arctic. So follow her. Um, also, oh my God, I'm completely blanking on people's names. I have COVID brain, also one-year-old baby brain, um, you know, filmmaker from Russia. I don't know. <sighs> okay, go to the, the new film page or my page after, and I will, uh, uh, put it down post, there in yeah. the, okay. I'm so sorry. I'm so embarrassed. He's going <laughs> to, I'm going to link his name after and you'll see. Uh, beautiful films, fascinating, different storytelling, because also the different colonizing influences, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Like, we have different colonizers, and it affects how our communities have played out. It's so interesting mm -hmm. to see. Yeah, and that kind of actually leads nicely into the next question. Do you think Nunavut is ready for international co-production, co-producing? We're actually in the midst of our first international, our first two internationals. <laughs> <laughs> Co-productions at the same time, one dot, We're one feature like with the Greenlandic Inuit. So yes, we are internationally co-producing, but even still, we're like we're doing it with Inuit <laughs> <laughs> through the colonizing countries. <laughs> <Through> the colonizing <laughs> countries. <laughs> so it's it's something completely new to us, and we're a little bit like, oh my gosh, how does this world work? I mean, co-producing with southern partners, which we've done a, a few times before. But um, to do an international co-pro is a completely different, different beast. So it's another thing that we're kind of stepping into and we're going to like embrace and learn as much about as we go. Yeah, we're ready to fail. We'll do another workshop in a couple of years and we'll tell you about international <laughs> co-pros. <laughs> okay, how close are we to having our own Inukdu TV station? <laughs> Oh, Hugh, you cheeky monkey. <laughs> um, I think, yeah. Um, some of you know that I've been on the board of TV Nunavut Educational and Broadcast Society for over a decade now. Um, and um, just recently, we switched from uh, calling ourselves TV Nunavut to calling ourselves Inuit TV. And we are pushing to uh, have an Inuktut language broadcaster created here in Nunavut that would hopefully also be accessible to other Inuit regions. And um, COVID's kind of interrupted stuff, um, but I feel like we're so close. So just keep an eye out in the news. Hopefully we'll have an announcement really soon. I feel like, you know, so many times in the last decade, I felt like it's about to happen. It's about to happen. Um, so I can't promise anything, but I do feel like we're, I'm, I'm optimistic. I'm like ruthlessly optimistic. I feel like it's going to happen really, really soon. So, so how we were talking earlier about how we need to be sharing more content with each other between KNR and, and T or any TV, 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 yeah. TV that's going to be a very, um, a very real thing soon, I think. Yeah. Hopefully. Okay. Fingers crossed. About to finish a draft and I would like to, would love to. Okay, do you want to take that one? Um, somebody's about to finish a draft of a script and would love to work with you. There's a really question there, though. So, okay. um, so let's just script that because there's not really okay. a question. Thank you for your answer regarding talking to the southerners. Um, oh, that's just a thank you. Oh, thank okay. you. Sardana, of course. Yay, yes. Yes, 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 yes. Alexi, thank you. It's Alexi. Good call. Alexi, <laughs> Russian. I can't pronounce People it. are helping us out but here yes, in the chat. Alexi, thank yeah. you. Um, the Russian Inuk filmmaker that um, I'm a fan of and could not remember the name of, but I'm so sorry, Alexi. It's Alexi. Um, and it's difficult to spell. So I will we'll list it in the links after. Um, or the, yeah. So just add us on Facebook and or Twitter and or Instagram and we'll link those things. Um, Will you please do another webinar soon? <laughs> <laughs> I'm a little embarrassed by this one, but okay, sure. <laughs> Stacy especially was just like, no! I didn't even like, want to watch you it. You sound smart. What is your problem? 
okay, Inuk and Turkish patterns are very similar. Would you consider making a documentary about the subject? Oh, for tattoos, oh, cool. probably. Oh, cool. um, yeah, I love tattoos from all over the world. I have books about tattooing from all over the world. There's so much beautiful um, spirituality shared across cultures, across different religions, and it just seems like there's so much. Um, it just feels like tattoos predate so much religion um, that things are just shared. I see things in Africa and just all over the world that are just um, eerily similar to our tattoos as well. So, of course, it's something I'm interested in, but in terms of making a film about that kind of stuff, um, I, I don't think so. I don't think I'm ready um, to do that. I, I just, I have other things I urgently want to make right now. I spent like a decade of my life obsessing about tattoos already, and I feel like I don't want to just be a, a one-hit wonder. <laughs> I want to make films about other subjects and I'm just really enjoying right now working on um, uh, being, a, being like a teammate and number one cheerleader for, for Stacy on her project ideas, um, working in comedy for the first time. So something I never, ever, ever thought I would do as a documentary yeah. filmmaker and I'm enjoying that. So It is really fun. I think one of the biggest things that has helped us is just having, having a partner, um, whether you're working together in terms of a company or you're working um, on your own separate things, but you're still like even when we weren't working together and working on completely different things, we would still huddle together and like be time. each other's cheerleaders and um, like give each other advice and just knowing that you're not alone because this is a hard, this is a hard space to work in. There's, it's, it's really challenging and it's, um, it's not a nine to five thing. There's no structure to it. You really have to be driving yourself forward constantly. And sometimes it's really hard to do. And um, having a partner, whether it's a company or a peer is really important. And I think that one of the ways that Alethea and I have made it work for ourselves is that we're kind of taking turns a little bit in terms of, all right, this is your year, Stacy. What are your projects that you really want to like go forward with and drive and be the voice of and, you know, Alethea has a one-year-old baby right now, so this is her year to be like, I'm going to be your cheerleader, cheerleader and I'm going to support you and do this. And then we're going to do another flip back and then I'm going to be her cheerleader at some point when Alethea is like, you know what, I have this story and this idea and I want to run with it now. This is, this is something I'm really passionate about and I have to be able to be in the space where I'm like, all right, I'm there, I'm producing and you're going to be the creative voice and the visionary for it. You go ahead and do it. When so, you're too depressed and answer an email, I'll handle it for yeah. you. <laughs> <laughs> but not everyone has that. I think we're, we're very lucky in that sense. And we built this working relationship. Together over years, us. over years. Like it wasn't, years, yeah, so. it wasn't something that came naturally to us, even within the, la the first five years of our working relationship. Yeah. I mean, I think we always vented to each other and shared ideas and debated yeah. storylines and helped story edit each other's stuff. But um we weren't like in business together until very recently and we were actually just talking about this the other day my dad uh my dad's advice to me and many people have given me this advice over the years don't go into business with your friend it'll ruin your relationship um i remember D derek Mazur, the former ceo of uh, nino film telling me um, it's actually harder to get out of a business relationship than it is a marriage. It's actually easier to get a divorce than it is to close a business and split up as a, as a business partnership. So um, for those of you starting out or being approached by Southerners to like collaborate or, you know, just know who you're working with, you can collaborate on projects without owning a company together. That is something that you can do. And that's what I strongly recommend unless you really know the person, really trust them. And not just knowing and trust them, knowing them as a business partner. Like we've worked together a lot for many years on projects without being co-owners of a company. So we're already professional colleagues. We, of course, we're also- um, But then even friends, still like, getting into business with each other, we had to be very conscious about like, all right, we can't like let things bother us and like let them simmer in our heads without talking. Like we kind of like had to come up with some rules to protect our friendship if we were going to yeah. be doing this together. We had to write out like our uh, um, shareholder agreement or whatever to be like, you know, let's assume one of us dies, gets hit by a bus. She always says this. <laughs> <laughs> 
Because I can't imagine, I can't imagine us ever like having a friendship breakup. So it's like uh, one of us has to, to die <laughs> yeah. for this to happen. But like if one of us dies, let's say both my husband and I get hit by a bus. And so Stacy's left to deal with a company that I part owned and I don't have a will. Who's going to like own the company? She might have to deal with complete strangers in my family that own half the company now because, you know, me and my family got killed in an airplane crash or something. My God, <laughs> this is so dark all of a sudden. Anyway, you have to write your shareholder agreements and plan with each other what the plan is in worst case scenario so that you're, you never have that being a stress on your interpersonal relationship all business be willing to talk business with each other without it conflicting your friendship so be careful there <laughs> is that a good place to end it's 904 yeah. i don't know <laughs> oh there's more. is there more oh my gosh oh god i thought we answered them all no this has been the best <laughs> Thank you. Uh, revised with a question. About to finish the draft, I would love to work with any filmmakers at this early stage. Rewrite and input. Um, reach out. How to reach out to Inuk writers. Okay. So if you have, okay. Um, this is actually an excellent question that's hard to answer, but. I was just going to be like, how do you? <laughs> <laughs> um, I strongly advise anybody who wants to write stories or produce stories set in the Arctic or with Indigenous people or Inuit or whatever um, to watch some first. So um, like I often get approached by people who want to tell a story and they kind of assume that it's an original one and I'm not kidding like 95 percent of the time they are not original. They're based on um, what they think they know about a people that they really don't know much about. And, and it's not their fault because their education system sucks for teaching um, Southerners anything about Inuit and who we Our are. Our education system sucks for teaching Inuit about Inuit. Yes, uh, <laughs> it's getting better, but it's still, you know, it is what it is. And especially in the South, things are starting to change. But honestly, adults working today have no idea about what it is to be Inuit. So their their stories tend to be rooted in something that's like you know s stereotypes that they learn through film or tv so watch content made by inuit before approaching inuit watch content made by indigenous people before approaching any indigenous people research the area so that you're not doing you're not taking up people's time with like inuit 101 um because we get that a lot. So do, doing taking that first step shows a level of respect for our time. Uh, and I really appreciate it when people do that. And then that often like changes people's minds about what story they even wanna try. Um, and then, you know, if you're just polite and, and have a, a short email saying, this is the theme or subject I'm interested in, does this interest you at all? Um, do you have time, you know, in your schedule for, for a collaboration? Are you interested? And then um, not having like a 16-page a um, message that would take a lot of work to read and respond to. And then not taking personal offense if someone doesn't have the time because, um, you know, there, there aren't that many Inuit filmmakers yet. Um, it's, it's increasing rapidly, but there aren't that many. And so we actually get a lot of um requests believe it or not you might not think so but honestly inuit have been put on film since film was invented literally so um we've been a popular subject especially in documentary for a long time and so we get approached all the time so just don't take personal offense try to be respectful of people's time and that's all i can say um and you know when it comes to us as individuals we're happy to take a look and if it's something that catches our eye or interest and in, in what our emotional state can handle in any given week um uh, then we will but if it and if it doesn't we're happy to try to connect with people that things might um be right for well cool. i think we've will come to the end of the questions <laughs> will you please do a podcast <laughs> i was actually working on the application while the video was playing for a <laughs> For a podcast. We are working on a podcast. So, yes, keep an eye out. <laughs> It'll be 
it'll be a mess. <laughs> it will be a hot mess. A fun hot mess. <laughs> All right, guys. Um, thank you. Thank you for um, having us, Nunavut Film. Yeah. This was, it was fun to record and fun to be here with you all. Yeah, we hope we won't be too embarrassed watching this later. <laughs> Take care, everybody. All right, good to go. Red Merrill out. <laughs> oh <my God. laughs>